All right, everyone, please stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, President McNow. Here. Vice President Clements. Here. Trustee Headland. Here. Trustee Clemenson. Here. Trustee Valentine. Here. Great. All right, moving on to the approval of the agenda, Ms. Shields. Be it resolved that upon the recommendation of the Superintendent of Schools, the Board of Education hereby approves the agenda as written. May I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? No? Great. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, it's wonderful, Celia, for you to be here this evening. You weren't here last time, and I don't think anybody could hear us, so it's great to be able to use my inside voice and be really well amplified. I appreciate that. Um, the next Board of Education meeting will be held on Thursday, May 4th at 7 p.m. in the district office. Um, we're going to be convening for an anticipated executive session for the purpose of discussing the employment history of a particular individual. Uh, the annual district meeting budget and trustee vote is going to be held on Tuesday, May 16th in the elementary school library. The polls will be open to registered voters from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. Uh, we're going to be convening at 7.30 p.m. right here in the auditorium to conduct our regular business, and uh, the results of the vote will be made you know, usually around 9 p.m., depending on how many of you turn out. Uh, applications for absentee ballots may be obtained via our website uh, on the annual budget page under Board of Education annual budget or by emailing our district clerk here, uh, Megan Shields. And finally, uh, we're going to have a voter registration day here in the district office on Thursday, May 10th from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, that's what I've got. Dr. Benante? Just a few remarks. I know we have a handful of presentations this evening. Uh, first, I wanted to mention to the board that we are conducting uh, athletic director, dean of student interviews this week. So I anticipate having more information to share with the board at the conclusion of the week. Uh, you may have heard that the state budget is finally finalized, uh, which is good news. Uh, Catherine and I were looking through some things this afternoon with the uh, aid runs that had come out uh, still being brought up to speed, but it does not appear that there's any significant impact on Haldane beyond what we already knew, so that's good. Uh, the budget newsletter will be going out later this week. Thank you to Megan and Catherine for putting it together. I just have a copy here. Uh, but it should hit your mailboxes over the weekend or at the beginning of next week. And lastly, I wanted to mention, uh, not only are we hiring or going through the process for the athletic director, we've been interviewing a number of teachers. Uh, it's been a pleasure to meet so many people who've been visiting uh, campus. Uh, we had a higher uh, last board meeting, but I was meeting with finalists today. And our building administrators and teachers do a great job on the front end of the process. Uh, whittling down, you know, what can be a pretty large applicant pool to a few candidates to come in, uh, meet with me, and I typically will meet with a finalist or two. Uh, and they do a great job assessing, I would say, areas of competence and pedagogy, uh, making sure that the science or the math or the special education teacher that we're hiring uh, uh, is a good practitioner. And it's been a pleasure on my end to meet with those candidates and really focus on the values of our organization. So I just wanted to circle back to something we had discussed at the board retreat in the fall, which was really uh, making explicit what our values are uh, that, what are the qualities and the attributes of our best employees? And now using that as a basis through one layer of the process to uh, evaluate uh, uh, the individuals who are coming to uh, uh, seek employment with our school district. It's been really, uh, it, it's been really uh, uh, good, and I feel everybody's feeling feels very good about the quality of the candidates now that we're moving forward. Not just that they're going to be good math, science, uh, special education teachers, but they truly embody the spirit of who we are uh, in some way uh, as a as a potential employee. So uh, that's been a pleasure, and I look forward to having some of those recommendations to you at our next meeting and throughout the remaining months of the school year. Uh, with that, if it's okay, Sean, I'll transition to the next Public budget here. presentation. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, let's hope this is the last one, right? Because uh, I don't think there'll be any others as long as the budget passes. Thank you, Megan, mm -hmm. for getting me set up. 
we had a, uh, z a virtual budget meeting right yeah. before this one, so it's very fresh in mind for all of us. Uh, so again, thank you to the board members who are able to attend our community budget forum online version. Uh, I'll provide a brief overview this evening for our public budget hearing. And I've divided this into two parts, uh, really by the propositions that'll be before the community for vote uh, in just two weeks time. So the first proposition is the one that our community is, uh, I'll say, used to seeing, uh, which it pertains to the budget in its entirety and whether or not the community is endorsing a levy, or I'm sorry, uh, the support for a budget of $28.2 million. This is how uh, the resolution will read when our community members go to vote at the polls on May 16th. And as we get into budget development process, something I talk about with the, our administrative team and our teacher leadership is that there are certain qualities and attributes that make our school district unique. Uh, three of them that I like to call out are the nature of the relationships between our students and our staff and our families. Uh, there's a close-knit nature uh, to that uh, relationship and that rapport that I think our community has come to expect, uh, both internally and externally. We benefit from fantastic community partnerships and a high level of engagement uh, with the broader uh, Phillipstown community that we take advantage of as part of our program. And Haldane has always done an outstanding job of balancing opportunities across academics, athletics, and the arts for what is a, a pretty small school district. We have outstanding opportunities for our kids in each of these areas that uh, are not, I'll say, restricted by our size. Uh, and that's something that when we think of all three of these, what makes Haldane unique? Some schools might have one or two of them, but I think Haldane is one of the only schools that has all three. We have a reality when we develop the budget of being mindful of the property tax cap. Uh, it's something, uh, while we have the ability to go override the tax cap, it's really not something that we uh, have tested or I've endorsed. Uh, the tax cap is formula-based, so it will vary year to year. Our property tax cap going into next school year is 1.96%. Uh, in comparison to previous years, it's relatively lower than where we've been in previous years. But as I said, it will fluctuate year over year. And as we went into uh, the upcoming school year, as the board's familiar with, I think, Sean, uh, you may have alluded to this, we do stand to benefit from uh, an increase in our foundation aid. Uh, and that foundation aid increase equates to just over $700,000. Uh, this is the final year of that phase in, as the board's familiar with. This has been a, a two to three year phase in process for the increase of foundation aid. Uh, we will not see increases like this again in the future. Uh, but now this becomes part of our base uh, foundation aid uh, and will benefit uh, from it. Uh, so taking the consideration the increased estate aid along with the levy increase, we stand, uh, we were in good position to enhance what already is a very good uh, program in the following ways. Increasing funding for special education, increasing our foreign language programming, uh, increasing our STEM programming, and it was important to us to maintain an interventionist position that was previously supported by the federal COVID relief fund. So those are expiring, uh, or we will have utilized all of those funds, I should say. And now it's our, uh, uh, it was our recommendation, and I know the board had supported this, in assuming or keeping that position in place uh, because it's been of good benefit to our kids, in particular at the elementary level. Just to cost this out, um, the... Well, I'll speak to it briefly and then uh, discuss the costs. We have uh, at various times uh, discussed as a school community how we could bring back uh, or maintain students who have exceptional uh, learning needs, uh, keep them inside of our programs here at Haldane. And we're in a position next year where we can create uh, a special class. This is for special education students uh, on the autism spectrum uh, to keep them here at Haldane where we otherwise may have in previous years referred those students to out of district programs. Uh, so we feel that we're in a good position from a planning perspective uh, as well as the ability to have a cohort of students uh, to create a special class for those students here at Haldane next year. 
Uh, in addition to that, uh, we see an opportunity to expand our special education programming for our secondary students, in particular those students who are in the high school uh, next school year. Those, that's the level of programming does, that does not currently exist. As I mentioned, the foreign language programming, which addresses a need that we currently have at the higher levels of French, our students who are uh, taking French courses, but also in lieu of just hiring a part-time teacher uh, to cover that need. And I think we would struggle, quite frankly, to find a part-time French teacher. We have the funding available to hire a full-time teacher and expand our foreign language programming into the intermediate levels. Uh, so that's a win-win as we see it. We have a base level of funding to start a coding and robotics uh, experience for our fifth grade students and potentially our fourth grade students. We're still planning that. Uh, that will allow them to engage in further opportunities for the design and the engineering process. Uh, as I mentioned uh, in previous uh, reports to the board, we made a commitment last year to expand the professional learning opportunities for our teachers at the elementary level. We'd like to supplement that funding in next year's budget and the maintenance of the intervention position, interventionist position at the elementary level is also listed here. Uh, so uh, the cost, uh, estimated cost of those positions are outlined here. The K-2 special class includes the cost not only of a classroom teacher but two classroom aides uh, that will provide additional support for those students. Uh, the cost of the secondary special education teacher, a foreign language teacher. Generally, when we're hiring a new teacher, we put the cost of that because it includes benefits right around $90,000. The reason the interventionist position differs slightly is because we still have uh, a, a little bit of federal money that will go into next school year, but it will, we'll have utilized it all early on in the school year. So this uh, cost reflects the, the balance that will be remaining uh, on that salary for the remainder of the school year. Jumped ahead here. Just to provide a revenue a summary, uh, we are a school district that is primarily funded through the local share or through the local tax levy. It's a $28 million budget, 22 million of which comes from the local taxpayers. Uh, we are scheduled to receive about $4.3 million in state aid. Uh, the asterisk there just denotes that this includes the significant increase to foundation aid that we have had uh, or we are expected to have next school year. Our other revenue is reflective of tuition. Uh, Garrison pays us tuition for their high school age students to come to our school district, it's about a million dollars. Uh, we have offset the anticipated budget deficit by using $600,000 of appropriated fund balance to offset our deficit. We do uh, anticipate, uh, or we have anticipated increases to um, teacher retirement system and employee retirement system costs. Uh, we see an increase in those almost every school year. This is why we have a reserve established uh, for increased costs in those areas. Uh, we are proposing to take $125,000 from those reserves to apply them to the budget to address increased costs in those areas. So uh, the board's been prudent in years past to fund the reserves. Uh, we have a base level of funding established that helps us as we go into budget development. And that's a strategy that we see we'll be able to continue to employ in future budget years if needed. That brings us to a budget total of $28.2 million. Just looking year over year, uh, the current year we're in, we're operating on a budget of $27.2 million. Next year's budget is proposed uh, to be and adopted by the board to be $28.2 million. That's the budget we're presenting to the community. It's a $1 million budget to budget increase. It's reflective of a 3.8% budget to budget increase, uh, a levy increase of $426,000, a tax rate increase of 1.96%. Uh, I won't get into great detail on the three component budget uh, summary, but it's here for reference by the community. It's posted on our website. We've gone into great detail about each of these components in, in previous budget presentations. We by law have to present the budget to the board in a three component format, admin, uh, program, uh, and capital. Uh, the respective areas of each component are listed here. 
And as the board's aware, I uh, worked with Ms. Platt and Ms. Dinio in previous years to show you a historical perspective of what our spending has been in each of these areas in previous years. So you could have a sense of what the trends are in those areas. What I'll just point out uh, for uh, sake of uh, brevity and perhaps clarity tonight, I encourage community members and our board to consider what the proportion of our spending is in each of these areas and has been in previous years and what it's scheduled to be uh, next year in the budget. So for admin, it's in the lower right-hand corner there. Uh, the admin component is 12.24% of our, of our total spending. Uh, that includes costs related to administration for the Office of the Superintendent, our finance uh, department, I'll say, some of our ancillary staff that work in that, those areas. Um, uh, and other uh, related employee benefits for those individuals. As we look at, oh, I skipped one again. My clicker's a little finicky. The capital component, so these are all of our maintenance and operation costs, just to speak to that generally. Again, as a proportion of our total budget, it's about 13% of our spending to keep our facilities running, to maintain, uh, excuse me, maintain our campus. Uh, all of the employees who come in uh, to support those areas. Uh, it also includes transportation. And then the program component really is reflective of the bulk of the work that we do here. It's 75% of our spending uh, is organized around program. Uh, that's our, those are our teachers, our teaching assistants, uh, really who our students come to experience in their schooling uh, experience here at Haldane each day. That's comprised, uh, that comprises about 75% of our spending. And if you were to look over years, this is actually the one area where we've, we've increased, uh, going from 70% to 75% of our spending as we bring in more individuals who uh, either work directly with our students or who provide supplementary support services to our kids. Now, uh, let me just make sure, yeah. Uh, most of uh, our community members are, are keen to ask, well, I get that it's a 1.96% increase, but what does that actually equate to in dollars on my tax bill? That's the right question. Um, so it depends on your home market value, and this is a chart we've included for a few years now. Depending on what your home market value is at a levy increase of 1.96%, this is what it equates to in actual dollars of what you can expect to see in an increase in your tax bill when you receive them in September. So if you have a home market value of around $500,000, uh, a 1.96% increase to the levy would equate to about a $138 increase to your tax bill. And we provide this on a, uh, across a range here for reference because we know home market values range quite considerably in our community. Proposition, so that's proposition one, high level overview. Uh, I would just encourage community members who may be listening or who are in attendance that if you wanted to dig deeper into any of those elements, all of our budget uh, materials that have been presented to the board over the previous uh, five months now, because uh, we start in January really with the board, are all posted on our district website underneath the budget tab. Uh, and then Catherine and I, uh, Catherine Platt, our business manager, and myself are available to answer any questions that community members have. Between now and May 16th, it's important to us that community members have their questions resolved uh, so that they in turn can make an informed choice when it comes to uh, voting on the budget on May 16th. So there's two things, uh, there's actually three things to vote on, but two uh, that cost money. Um, well, one that costs money, I'll say. Two that has financial implications. And the third is our trustee seat. Uh, so the first proposition is the budget in its entirety. The second proposition is a vehicle purchase proposition. Uh, we uh, have proposed, and I know the board has supported, the replacement of one 30-passenger uh, school bus. School buses are expensive. It's going to cost $78,000 to replace that vehicle as well as two maintenance vehicles that we use on campus, a tractor, which is sorely needed. Um, we're in the process of repairing our tractor. Uh, we don't want to repair it anymore. We need a new tractor. Uh, that's for things like snow removal, other maintenance projects on or around our campus, as well as a pickup truck. These vehicle purchases are financed over a five-year period. And what I try uh, to explain, sometimes I, I nail this, sometimes I, I have to explain this. We attempt to assume an amount of debt here that is equal to debt that is expiring. So it's tax neutral. So generally this is $180,000 or so of a cost 
we're trying to bring on this cost uh, at a time when we have approximately $180,000 of debt expiring. So it does not, uh, this becomes a tax neutral proposition, meaning it will not cause an increase uh, to the tax bills, if you will, uh, based on what people are already paying. So when I say, well, one of these propositions has a more significant financial impact than another, this is a tax neutral pop proposition, meaning it's not gonna cost any additional money than what folks are already paying. It's already essentially included in your tax bill. Um, as we've worked out the financing for the vehicles that we're bringing on against the vehicles that we are paying off. I do wanna speak just for a minute to the conversion to electric vehicles because I've had uh, a few questions about this. The board received a, a question or two or a comment or two along the way. Uh, first of all, we um, are required to purchase electric vehicles, any new vehicle purchase uh, after 2027. So right now we are scheduled to purchase a diesel vehicle, but by state law, any new vehicle purchased uh, uh, after 2027 has to be electric. As I've expressed to the board in years past when this has come up, uh, the base model pricing is a point of concern in that electric vehicles are significantly more expensive than diesel vehicles. Doesn't mean we don't do it. It just needs to be a realization. It's just something we have to realize that it's at uh, almost three times the cost. So on our replacement schedule that we've uh, generated uh, and the propositions that we've presented to the community in the past, we've taken great care to present those as tax neutral propositions. At some point in time, they no longer will be because the vehicles that we're paying off will have been diesel and the newer vehicles we'll bring, bringing on will be electric and those electric vehicles are gonna cost more. Um, we have explored our eligibility for grants. Uh, we do not believe we are a community that uh, would be eligible for any grant opportunities through the federal government, just based on our relative wealth in the community. Um, that's just something FYI, uh, if you will. Uh, but it's something we should continue to remain uh, apprised of as we go into our planning. As I've shared with the board in the past, it would benefit the board, quite frankly, it would benefit the administration at this point to take the time in the fall as we bring on a new director of facilities and transportation to map out our anticipated replacement schedule and to begin to, begin to anticipate if we were to incorporate the purchase of an electric vehicle into that schedule, what will the net cost be to the taxpayer uh, based on a similar scale that we provide for the school budget. And that's something that we'll do. Uh, one thing, uh, just a couple other additional points here. We don't currently have the charging station infrastructure in place for we to purchase uh, said vehicle to charge it. And it's our understanding that that infrastructure, we should be prepared for that to take uh, six to 12 months for installation. Uh, as you uh, are aware in our work with uh, CS Arch um, in their campus master planning process, they have accounted for how a charging station, where it would appropriately fit on our campus, how that segment of our campus would be appropriate structured to accommodate uh, conversion to electric fleet. CS Arch will be here next month to do their final uh, presentation to the board. And that's something that's already reflected in their planning, but uh, you will see that again there. Um, just some other incidental things are listed here regarding uh, vehicle ranges and whatnot. We do think that our maintenance needs will go down. That being said, our training needs are going to go up. That's something we have to be prepared for. Uh, Peggy had noted during the community budget uh, process, we do a great job maintaining our existing fleet. Tom McKeel is outstanding, uh, keeping our, our buses running. We would wanna make sure Tom is in a good position to have whatever he needs to assume as much uh, uh, responsibility from the maintenance of those vehicles as we can do internally, that's good for us, uh, while learning about the ins and outs, if you will, of electric vehicles. So that's something we need to be uh, prepared for is what are our, our, our staff's training needs going to be and how are we going to make sure that they're trained to maintain this fleet once we begin the conversion. Okay. Uh, circling back, uh, the contingency budget is, uh, um, so if the budget does not pass, uh, on May 16th, the board has a couple of options. The board can call for a revote in June um, with the exact same budget or can charge the administration or work with the administration to reduce the budget by some amount. The board also has the option to go right to a contingency budget. We have to set the tax levy at zero if we go to a contingency budget. 
excuse me, uh, that's a decrease of $426,000 uh, within the budget if we have to do so. So just something to be familiar with. Luckily, we haven't been in this position in the past uh, a few years, certainly, knock on wood, uh, but it's something for us to be aware of, of what the consequences are if the budget does not pass. Um, if the budget does not pass uh, and then we put it out to a second vote and it doesn't pass again, you have to go to a contingency budget. The levy has to be set at zero. We have to make $426,000 in reductions in the budget at that point as well. So those are various scenarios that can play out if the budget doesn't pass. The community has been very supportive in the past uh, and it's obviously our hope that they will continue to be. The budget vote, May 16th, starting at 7 a.m. at Haldane Elementary, which was our voting location last year. Absentee ballots are available in the district office, also on Haldane's website. Two propositions, school budget, vehicle proposition, as well as one board of education uh, position. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention we have one candidate running for one seat. So Dr. Clements' seat has expired. Uh, Dr. Clements has indicated that she's uh, running again and has submitted all of her materials for that. She's the only individual who is running for that open seat. That must be the end of the presentation because the thing stopped clicking. So <laughs> I will pause there. Megan can take me out of it. Um, great. So uh, thank you very much, Dr. Yes. Benante, for what uh, you described beforehand as perhaps our first, our, our last public presentation <laughs> in the budget. Um, and uh, this is now our opportunity to move in to our public hearing um, for which we need to vote. So may I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No? Uh, this is the first of three opportunities for public comment this evening. At this moment, this is just any questions or considerations related to the budget. If there's anyone from the community who has any questions or not? No? I don't think so. All right. Well, then, um, I'd like to make a motion to close this public hearing. Uh, may I have a motion, please? I should say. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No? Great. Um, with that, though, I would also like to thank uh, Catherine Platt and Dr. Benante uh, for their incredible work this year on putting together a budget. It's a budget that not only maintains all of our current programming, but I think uh, continues to expand the programming in ways that we've sought to do over the past several years. And special congratulations to you, Ms. Platt. This, this is your first uh, complete year, your first complete budget. You did a wonderful <laughs> job, and thank you for being a great partner throughout the whole process. Well, you have all of our faith and trust, so thank you. <laughs> Great. We have two special presentations right. this evening. Uh, one is an elementary math textbook recommendation for the board, as well as a discussion item around elementary class sizes, and I think there's some families here who, who are interested in that presentation, and I'll just note there is a public comment period scheduled directly after that, so uh, if folks are interested in commenting on either of those presentations, there'll be an opportunity to right after the presentations or uh, that information is presented. Uh, with that, I'll ask uh, Mr. Elder and Ms. Jammin to come on up and begin the elementary math textbook recommendation, long awaited. It's been alluded to several times over the last couple of months that this presentation will be coming. No, it's jam-packed with exciting information. I am. Great. I'm gonna step aside. Good evening, everybody. And uh, Ms. Jammin and myself are here to kind of give us a, a final update here on our textbook um, uh, resource uh, selection process we've been going through that uh, we've been keeping you updated on over the course of the last, I'd say, year and a half or so. And so we kind of like to present some finality to that um, tonight. So as we started off on this process uh, from a more higher level, and when I say this process, um, you know, it involves um, Ms. Jam and myself and all K-5 um, educators in the elementary school, including obviously special education teachers, general education teachers, and our math AIS specialist. Uh, so when I talk about the process, um, we're gonna allude to it a little bit more and get a little more in depth about it, but it really encapsulates um, everybody at the elementary school, and that was one of our kind of uh, major areas of focus as we started of this is that everybody contributed, everyone had a voice, and everyone was involved in that piece. But um, two simple things that we started off with in trying to kind of frame this 
um, endeavor for our teachers is the first is, you know, what resource best supports students' learning of the standards? And so as there's been a significant amount of work in elementary math standards over the last years and as it continues to evolve, um, it continues to be a grounding area for us to look at when we're thinking about uh, new resources. I mean, the end game is students learning mathematics and doing extremely well with mathematics. And so those standards provide anchor points or guidance areas for us um, as we think about the design of our units, and so our resources should also be aligned in ways that we feel that really support students' understanding and demonstrating understanding of those resources. Uh, the second piece of that is, and I've alluded to it a bunch of times, is what resource best reflects our philosophy for how we'd like to teach mathematics here in Haldane. Uh, and that gets that more localized um, kind of value statements to that. And so when talking about our values here uh, at Haldane, we obviously anchor or go really quickly to the Haldane Essentials. And so this was another opportunity uh, for us as a, as a faculty and as a school to really dive into the meanings of these as uh, ways that we start looking at things. Um, particularly in those, you know, we're looking at critical thinking, problem solving, communication, growth mindset. It's not that emotional intelligence and wellness is not important in the Haldane Essentials, but the degree to which those are manifested themselves in a math resource um, are bonuses in lots of ways, but many math resources are not set up with wellness as the forefront of, of the backbone of their, 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 their construction. So really we're starting these cognitive processes of critical thinking, problem solving, communication, and this growth mindset um, with students. One of the things that we really stressed uh, in working with a large group of our teachers at looking at multiple different resources as we went through this was to be very clear or to just put out there up front that, listen, no resource we look is going to be absolutely perfect and meet every single one of our needs, right? So we honed in on this idea that um, inevitably this process is going to uncover gaps, omissions, inadequate treatment of certain areas. Um, and so really good conversations that we had all throughout was this idea that all omissions are not the same. And really the key is how easily our teachers and our schools feel that we can say we can fill these gaps um, in this. So uh, part of this as we went through uh, in, in this process is to always take back uh, time to step back and say, well, what's missing? What are we not seeing in this? And having really good conversations about that and thinking if that was a barrier to us moving forward or something that we felt as a learning community that we'd be able to address in other ways and what those ways might look like. Um, but it was really good when you're working with so many people to understand that we're not gonna find one thing that's gonna fit everything exactly what we're looking for uh, in a process. I think that's you, Ms. Jan. All right. So you last saw this slide with myself and Judy Barbera a good year, two years ago at this point, when we were talking about the process we were going to enter into starting last year. So this is the selection process for a quality resource that's recommended by Ed Reports. Um, and we really looked into this with our committee that was starting and felt like it matched how we wanted to approach the selection. So you'll just see this language as we go through. So you start with preparing and establishing our process, developing the lens and our priorities for the resource we're looking for, narrowing down our choices within the resources available, investigating those materials, and then here we are at the making a decision. So as we looked at our process, as Josh mentioned, we wanted to make sure we had a representative committee, and that committee was able to touch base with the, um, with the other teachers who weren't on it and be able to gather their feedback and bring it back. So we had one general education teacher from every grade who was then able to meet with their grade level, collect their feedback and bring it back to the committee. Two special education teachers, uh, one who was at the primary and one who was at the intermediate level who would be able to bring their perspective. Um, our math AIS teacher and then myself and Mr. Elder um, all participating throughout the process. It is. So our first step was to go back and look at Eureka, which was the resource we have been using for quite some time, um, and to look at that and collect input from our teachers on what the strengths and gaps of our current math program were so that then we could prioritize what we wanted from a new program and make sure that anything we selected was an improvement on what we had and met the priorities that we had. So we collected that information, met as a committee, reviewed and prioritized the strengths and gaps of Eureka, and then created our lens um, for what we were hoping for from a new program. So that's a clickable link for you guys where you can see these um, 
rating sheets that were created for each of our priorities. So this is just a sample of what it looked like, but it had what our look-fors were and a place for comments from our committee members. And in that first section, under the phase one, we had six areas where we evaluated a pretty wide range of materials. We had, I'm going to steal some of it from later, but um, we had selected uh, resources that were used by local districts, well-rated resources, um, and recommendations from some of the literature on what was coming out. And we evaluated them in the committee on those six areas that came out of our priorities. So the rigor and mathematical practices, their coherence, promoting success for all students. Um, so that would be our students who are struggling with math, students who are struggling with reading, um, special education students, um, any of those areas how easy it was for our teachers to use the resource, navigate it, find what they need, and then also the availability of professional development for our teachers as we were, would implement a resource. Um, once we had narrowed it down, we moved into phase two, and with a narrower selection, and this is what we presented on during the course of last year, was going from, I believe we started with six, um, and then we took those six and really looked at specific instructional tasks within units, uh, the assessments that were provided, the usability with them actually in front of us. We got samples from each of those, brought them in. Our teachers had access to going through the materials, um, going through the, both the physical materials, the student materials, and the available digital materials. Um, and so how easy were those to navigate? How did they feel like materials were um, organized and uh, accessible? And then how did they promote success for all students? What were the assessments, the scaffolding, and the differentiation that were available within it? So those were then looked at in detail for a narrow uh, set of resources. And oh, there it is. So we surveyed the districts, we reviewed the research, and then we selected from those highly rated and recommended resources to get to that, um, to that selection. I think this is you. And so just to review, uh, during last year, we had um, reported upon this, but last, mostly last year was a lot of exploration of our materials and trying to uh, get those choices narrowed down um, and a lot of uh, virtual sessions with vendors, about Q&A sessions about their programs um, and grade level uh, opportunities to deliver some of the lessons in there. As you, as you might recall, at the end of last year, um, we reported out that we weren't in a really good place to make a decision. Um, our teachers didn't feel like they were in a really good place to make a decision. Uh, for implementation for the fall for a variety of reasons. Uh, one, we just didn't feel like there would be really good prep time for individuals to get ready for a fall impl implementation. But the other piece of it was that teachers, uh, the feedback we gathered also was that where they may have tried out a lesson or two in some of their classrooms, it just wasn't a large enough sample size. They were making generalities based upon a, a one or two simple things they were seeing and kind of generalizing that to an entire class or a program. And we just didn't think that that was extremely prudent. And so because we weren't really in this tremendous rush, we had reported that we kind of revamped our timeline and to be thinking about what we would do in the fall to kind of dive a little bit deeper into the, the finalists that we really had for the program, which is exactly what our focus was um, during the beginning of this school year in the fall, um, which really honed in on uh, a couple of programs, uh, getting those materials from vendors, uh, which is no small feat uh, to get free materials from people to give into to grade level classrooms. Um, and once we felt like we, we had those, really giving teachers an opportunity to pick units of study that they would implement. And by units of study, we're talking a good five, depending on what it is, I'd say anywhere from five to 10 series of lessons that culminates in some sort of an assessment experience uh, for our students. Students. Um, and those didn't all happen at the same time, right? Uh, because of pacing in certain places, uh, we allowed opportunities for teachers to kind of select when the best entry point to that would have been. So there was some flexibility there. But uh, the point there was that was happened over two different scenarios with different programs, uh, which really gave our teachers a much better look into the program as it was laid out, as they were designed. Um, Along that time, uh, I think a couple of things we really benefited from was we had virtual visits with other schools. So 
Uh, we had reached out to local schools that were implementing the programs that were meddling in our classrooms. And really along those lines of like omissions or gaps, we started to think about some of the really good questions that we were still wondering about our programs and extremely beneficial to talk with educators that are already implemented it and we could just very much so ask those questions and get their feedback on upon there and also start thinking about like, you know, many of these programs were only in their first year or second year of implementation. So there was a good degree of growing pain. So we were benefit to be able to say, if you were going to do this all over again, what would you do? And so we got some really good feedback from that. Um, but our teachers really benefited from those conversations. And they weren't surface level. I think our, 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 our virtual visits were like two hours in length. So uh, pretty comprehensive about that. Um, and then we had ways in which we uh, came back and had each grade level kind of um, go through and assess each program based upon those templates we had shared uh, through kind of a Google survey format to kind of get everyone to vote, so to speak, um, and lend uh, a lens of really providing responses to us about what choice they felt like they really felt really comfortable with um, based upon our, um, our, our, our criteria we established and everything we had gone through and, and what they felt most comfortable with moving forward. I can't remember, is that me or you? I think this is still you. This is still me. So at the uh, end, the conclusion was uh, Eureka <coughs> Squared is the program that teachers uh, had recommended for implementation. So uh, just some background, uh, what Eureka Squared is, is uh, just the name of it. It is a, a newly updated version of the current Eureka program that was built, established, um, but they had received a tremendous amount of feedback during their last 10 years or so, and um, in a competitive market, they had come up with um, a way of revamping their curriculums based upon some of that feedback as well as some other enhancements. Um, and at the end of this process we had gone through, uh, Eureka Squared was always one of those ones that was in the runnings. Um, I think there's for a variety of reasons. Um, one, there was a tremendous amount of familiarity with some of our teachers about the language and coherence with it. Um, but I would say, as somebody who learned both programs going in, it's not just a carbon copy in some slight changes. There are some really significant overhauls that were made through the current Eureka program based upon the trajectory of math instruction in elementary schools and this competitive market uh, that really made some significant changes that really resonate with some of our teachers. Um, as we had gone through some of the feedback process, we just listed some of the, the feedback that had come back was um, teachers were saying ultimately that uh, the program and the way it was laid out led to uh, greater independence for students, greater opportunities for students to work independently or to discuss mathematics or to share their thinking in a bunch of different ways. Uh, lots of opportunities built into the program for differentiation uh, that was very user friendly for teachers as well as very user ability for our students uh, in terms of the materials that were provided to them. Uh, the lesson plans they found were a very similar structure to their current curriculum. Um, and this was a strength of the, what teachers identified as a, as a strength of the current program versus the new one as well as uh, there were a lot of things about Eureka that teachers really, really liked in terms of the coherence and the layout and the design structure. They thought that there was a tremendous amount of areas for improvement in digital resources, the user ability for, for students, the way that um, problems are laid out on pages, uh, changes to the word problems themselves. Um, uh, that Eureka Squared really um, kind of addressed in some of that. And we had, uh, when we did our virtual um, visit with one of the schools that was implementing it, I think in the first 20 minutes, they were speaking about the changes that exactly all of our teachers were looking for uh, in many ways in, in, a new, in a new program. So it definitely resonated. Uh, they were talking about the actual student edition for students, uh, which was a big change, was much more easier for students to read, much more space for students to put their answers, much more uh, opportunities to expand upon their answers, um, um, visually stimulating for kids. Uh, and this was a lot of the feedback teachers were also getting from students as they were implementing the program. Um, and that the lessons, uh, some of the mini lessons themselves were very concise, engaging, tasks were extremely well structured and, and more challenging uh, questions were presented at the end and it lets, lent itself to a, a very nice math workshop model. Another piece of it uh, that's not up here um, that was talked about was some of the uh, additional um, elements of the program for purchase, like manipul man, uh, manipulative kits for each grade level, which um, were uh, much needed within uh, the K-5 elementary curriculum and were specifically designed to really model and go against uh, the modules that presented this. And so as teachers got some of uh, their hands on some of these and saw some of these, they got really excited about the ways in which students were doing a lot of the hands-on activities that were included in the process. 
uh, Ed reports had come out with an evaluation criteria for Eureka Squared, and as I think it had gone through many of the areas that we looked at, uh, there's lots of ways it meets uh, the expectations from that report. I'm not going to go in tremendous depth through each of the grade levels, um, but uh, you know, through that process, it was independently evaluated as meeting expectations, um, which is one of the highest rated things that we were looking at th through the process. And uh, this is just from our, from our meetings with Eureka Squared and thinking about what are the differences and why are we doing it. Uh, the, the summary is that Eureka Squared took a lot of the, Eureka is still uh, very highly rated and comes in um, as meeting expectations in all of those categories as well. But they've really worked to include more math models, uh, include the rigor. Um, one of the things that the vendor talked about and the schools that we visited talked about were the changes to language that they put so that they were making sure that as much as possible, reading will always impact whether you understand what a math problem is asking you when you're, you're doing a word problem or you're reading explanations, but really trying to make sure that the language was accessible so that all students can do the best that they can. You can't fully remove reading and literacy from a math curriculum, but making sure that the language was accessible was a real focus, and our teachers saw that. Uh, the schools that we spoke to saw that. Um, and it was something that came out in the final um, evaluations as well. So adding that accessibility and flexibility. Um, we were able to look at the teacher materials, uh, which included the teacher lesson plan books as well as the student materials. Um, we saw those both digitally and we got um, hard copies of them, were able to use them. The digital materials, so there are digital materials that can be accessed by students and teachers as far as creating lessons, um, projecting uh, information up on the board, showing demonstrations to students um, and visuals that go along with it, and as well as the manipulative kits, a sample of one of the grade levels, I believe that's a second grade kit, um, are up there which uh, include the kinds of manipulatives that help children develop number sense, which is actually something that we didn't have under the previous. I don't know honestly whether it was available at some point and it just wasn't something that was selected as part of the resource, but we had been looking at ways to supplement Eureka, uh, the former regular Eureka, uh, with manipulatives that allowed that tactile understanding of how numbers build on themselves, um, and these are a really good start. There are certainly additional manipulatives that we have that we uh, use with our math curriculum, but the ones that came all really seem to work for our students, which is, um, which is a real positive. No materials are perfect, as we mentioned before, so there are continuing to be gaps. One gap that we saw in all of the resources that we evaluated was when we talk about materials that support all students, the kinds of differentiation and intervention resources are all additional pieces. So we aren't recommending with this a adoption of a, re of a resource that would support our AIS classes. Um, we feel like what we saw is that those are really a separate resource and should really then be investigated separately. There are some that came along with Eureka or some of the other resources that, um, that we looked at, but we felt like we hadn't gone into it looking for a different resource. We'd hoped that some of that would live within what we found, and instead I think we're going to have to look wide in that search and look at things not just that are associated with the primary resource, but are there things that are developed with that, um, that goal in mind? And so we may be using other resources for that remediation that um, students need if they're pulled from the classroom. So that we saw across the board and it remains here, and we'll continue using the resources that we have for that, but also supplementing and looking and investigating to see if there's anything more that would be better for our students. Oh, it but bounced twice, oh, both ways. Um, one of those criteria that we'd had was around professional development. Because this would be a transition of Eureka to Eureka Squared, there is, um, familiarity with many of the components. So what they recommend is four hours of professional development uh, that would be provided this spring. Um, we would be recommending May and June grade level planning time where our teachers would be able to have those resources in front of them and 
uh, work together and their teams to transition and be ready for the fall. We also plan for some summer curriculum writing hours where again they'd be able to really dig in, certainly not plan the whole year, but at least have, be in really good position with those starting uh, units of school. Uh, and then in September and October, continuing to give time and attention to planning for then the winter and then the spring. Um, using some of our time in September and November conference days to give our teachers time for that planning and um, go from there. Thank you very much for a comprehensive overview of the process of selection. And I'm glad that we've arrived at, at, at a choice. Um, and um, I'm sure that the, all our staff is very excited that they're not going too far afield from what they're currently working on and that it feels successful so far. You know, I mean, that's, that's very wonderful. That's wonderful. Um, my primary question was about um, professional development. So you know, I, I'm square there. Um, I'm curious about the summer hours and do each, do, does, does the team receive the summer hours for uh, curriculum development or do individual teachers, are they allotted hours to sort of develop curriculum yes. on the class by class? Mm -hmm. The second is Both. what you're saying. Both. 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 Oh, but, well, yes. So okay. I think okay. going okay. into the process and budgeting um, for the summer, what we had done is taken all of our K-5 teachers, special education teachers, general ed teachers, and our math AIS and set aside uh, a specific amount of hours for each one of them that will be specifically for uh, math K-5 elementary development. The goal is they get together as a group and come in together and right. plan it together as one. Um, but the hours are paid out individually to Great. those individuals. Great. Um, but we did had asked for an increase in our summer curriculum um, our writing budget for this uh, upcoming summer, knowing that we'd have this kind of larger scale implementation. And so we still want to offer hours to other teachers in the district for other various projects that they have as well. Great. Um, I, I open the, the floor to anyone else who might have any questions. <laughs> I have a couple from very specific to very general. Very specific. Did you notice anything different about how they approach um, the options for virtual learning? So it was interesting. A lot of the programs that had virtual learning, they're now separate. Like so, okay. you could get that module or those components separately. So, Eureka Squared, as we would purchase it, doesn't have any virtual components, but there is an ease to sharing slides, and sure. I think that comes from you know, like, okay, now we're on Zoom and I'm sharing my yeah, slide deck with you, but it doesn't. Um, they haven't baked that into mm -hmm. their... The, the oh. slides are, but not a yeah. virtual, like where you would go on and see yeah. video instruction in okay. the same way. Mm -hmm. Those yeah. seemed to be separate, at least. Um, yeah. Second one was, you talked a lot about no curriculum is perfect, uh, gap identification and how you remediate it. That You brought up one example, which is great, which is doesn't include, didn't specifically include AIS type materials. That would have to be a separate investigation and, and decision. Anything, anything else that you can point out that was, this wasn't in there, but we have a plan to remediate it. Anything else? So, I mean, the only other thing that I would say that uh, highlighted, that was highlighted by different teachers, and it was different at different grade levels, okay. so mm -hmm. maybe it's a little bit uneven. So some of the grade levels spoke to how it might, on a particular unit, lend itself to your higher level students and they would need to then remediate for a student who needed more scaffolding. And then for other units, they felt like it was solid for the students who would need that scaffolding, but they would have to add the higher level problem solving or critical thinking. So different units at different grade levels, they saw, I think, a little bit of both. And that's something, again, we heard across other curriculums that were investigated as well. Some of them all the units were included the basics and would have needed extension to the problem solving and critical thinking across the curriculum. Okay. Others, they felt like it did that, but had very little scaffolding. Eureka, I would say the feedback I heard was variable by unit, but the teachers felt like where they saw those needs, they felt like they were able to either have the knowledge to provide that scaffolding or be able to do like the cross-curricular kind of work that would lead to the problem solving and extensions. Okay, cool. 
All right, last one. This one's for Josh. Um, so we've talked a lot about um, over time and for, certainly for your position about pulling curriculum all the way through the entire district. Mm -hmm. So talk to, give us a little overview of how you see this curricular decision fitting in with transition to middle school mm -hmm. and then into high school and how is it scaffolded yeah. all the way up? Absolutely. So I think one of the opportunities that presents itself when you have any sort of resource adoption, such as math, is you know it automatically lends itself to going through a process over the next couple of years of really fidelity of implementation of it. So it can create you know these opportunities where you're working with grade level teams and these kind of data teams, so to speak, as it, as everybody's new in the process of developing these lessons and moving through. You start having conversations, better conversations around common assessment assessments and pulling people together to ensure that, look, are we on the same pace? What are we seeing? And then, um, you know, as we get, you know, more clarity around these common assessments and then looking at the results of those assessments and seeing what our students have either really mastered or did not do really or, or, or did not master um, in real time to be able to say as a result of kind of doing something new, maybe we need to do spend some time reteaching before we move forward. And so I think that's a natural evolution of any time you implement any new curriculum. I think that's where the opportunity presents itself. So. One of the things that uh, you know is also inherent in any one of these that you'd have to go through in terms of a gap is you know all of these brands are generally nationally created in mm -hmm. some way, shape, or form using the the context of next generation standards, and New York State has kind of adopted their own version of next generation standards, which are extremely similar to the national ones, but obviously New York wants to do some things a little differently. So there's automatically going to need to be a gap analysis that takes place between what the prints are of what's being provided and what New York State is asking to ensure that all those standards are being hitting. So I think what is going to happen here to your answer about what is it K-12 is I think over the next few years it really lends ourselves to really having some really good conversations about what standards are being implemented, what needs to be gapped, how are we assessing those in real time, how are we meeting as a grade level team to be able to kind of analyze the results of those and plan moving forward and really using those true formative assessments, so to speak, that moves up. Um, the idea would be that we get a greater sense of who our students are uh, with their mathematical fluency and competency. Um, not to say that it's not happening now, but as you get familiarity with programs, some of the times those conversations, those things just kind of wane itself. But everybody's going to be a novice new person in some way, shapes, or forms. Uh, and so I think a natural re reaction to that is that it's going to create a tighter unit um, or presents the opportunity for, for some tighter conversations around this implementation that I think will lend itself to just knowing our students better in terms of mathematics and what other things may need to be happening or where some of those gaps really are. So um, I would say as this kind of presents itself, what we'd see is that kids are transitioning from five to six in middle school. Ideally, we'd like to see some of the areas that we've been noticing that we'd want to see our students' mathematical competencies increase. Um, I think that's the whole reason of going through this process was identifying that the current resource was lacking in some ways, and we're looking for something to really help us lift that up in some ways. So uh, I don't think it's going to be like a, in the first year or so, but I do think that as we start implementing this moving through, um, we'd, we'd, we'd find a scenario where that, that would hold true. Let me, great, thank you. Let me ask, let me ask a, a, a slightly different question. Um, to what extent was the middle school team engaged in this process, and how does this curriculum specifically link with what's taught in six through eight? Sure. So six through eight, uh, a couple years ago, I had ident uh, uh, adopted the big ideas yep. curriculum, yep. Um, which is what they're currently utilizing. Mm -hmm. When we went through this process, we had involved our middle school teachers as well, right? Okay. And to that point, even our high school teachers, because there are components of big ideas which are used, and I think in our ninth and some of our 10th grade classes, okay. uh, to better understand what the benefits of those had been uh, and how that kind of could translate down into an elementary piece. Um, you know, there were teachers who were involved in meeting with our K-5 math committee and providing their lens. There were opportunities where we spoke with some students about their experiences in the big ideas. Um, I think one of the things we did start to see, though, is that, you know, when you start getting into 6th, 7th, and 8th, math and math teachers become more departmentalized, mm -hmm. right? They are focusing on math, and there tends to be, a, uh, where they have this resource, a strong degree of supplementation that goes in, right? It, it, it anchors as a foundation for a lot of things and provides a lot of ways of, of differentiating, but there is a tremendous amount of individual component that happens with that happening. Um, we didn't find any massive variance to be able to think that this program would 
drastically interfere with their experiences or really butt heads with the program that's happening so it wouldn't be this brand new language. Uh, in transparency, Big Ideas was one of the programs we really did look at in our K-5 process um, because we knew if adopted it could be a K-10 process. Um, and so that level of coherence was exciting to us in a lot of ways. Um, and it just, as, as we looked through it, our teachers just did not feel really comfortable with the big ideas in the elementary level um, for a variety of different reasons. Um, so we didn't want to force it at, at one point. Um, but I do think that that is definitely something that is, we're looking at in terms of how does it talk to each other and what does that look like yeah, yeah. as kids move forward. Yeah, awesome. Thank you very much. Yep. Appreciate it. I got one quick question, Jeff. Because um, so, I'm so naive to the you know, the value of, of data. Um, for you, in your evaluation, and you said, you know, I heard assessment and I heard competency. What specific things are you going to be looking at when you evaluate this implementation? For example, are you gonna look at AIS numbers? Do they drop or do they go up? Are you looking at, you know, just what other metrics to you are valuable because I, I, again, you know, stats and data can be very subjective. But what specifically is valuable to you? I, I, on recognizing also that teacher input is probably the most valuable thing. Mm -hmm. But uh, what's what's there for you that you want to bite into when we? Yeah, do I think one of the things to address that head on is I'd be looking at the assessments that are there and the validity of those assessments. And so what I really look at is you know. Do those assessments really uh, assess what mathematical skills or competencies are those questions linked to? And so I think with this new implementation, time is going to be spent really looking at what those assessments are, and, you know, a question analysis, so to speak. You know, this question is really tagging this competency or this standard, and so is this one and this one. So uh, one of the benefits of the program is there is a, a pretty strong digital component. Anything that is given in a workbook is also available online um, in a digital uh, opportunity. And so there are opportunities for kids to do assessments um, computer-based assessments, which, you know, isn't the sole reason, but, you know, New York State is moving towards compu computer-based testing, so there's a, there's a competency there, but I think the benefit of that is that there's an analysis section of those assessments that when kids take those assessments digitally, it's an analysis button you hit and you, it spits out this information instantaneously in some ways. And so having a really strong understanding of how those questions are aligned to certain standards um, I think is going to be really eye-opening to be able to, under, to, to, to see with our kids how well they're actually meeting some of those benchmarks. To your point, yes, I would say I, I, I hope it leads to um, ideas of students um, you know, decreasing AIS numbers. I think that's the goal of any instruction, anytime. Um, I'm not sure if it's going to be a direct correlation, um, but I do think that would be something we should be able to see in some ways. I think we'd have a better understanding of uh, what standards our students are mastering, and if there are any overarching trends we're seeing in deficiencies and how we stop gap that. I think it'll be a, a, a situation where we can really stand back and take a really good look at the ways that we teach mathematics elementary wise. Thank you. Is there anything to say about um, parent support with Eureka Squared moving forward? You know, as we're furiously Googling tape diagrams mm -hmm. for our third graders and things like that. <laughs> I mean, you know, th and some teachers are, are a little bit more open about resources, but does that, is that play into it at all? Is that a thought at all for when looking at these options? I didn't look at that specifically with our teachers. That said, maybe that's just something we need to be better at overall. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'd say Eureka has the videos for all of those things and they ha still haven't been accessible and I'm still hearing from parents that it's tricky and it's hard to support those things and the vocabulary and I've been a parent furiously Googling tape diagrams myself. Um, so I, I understand that and I don't know if the textbook would get us there alone anyway, but it's something to think about and how our teachers can help it not be so frustrating to help with homework. And I think you might have said this, but um, Eureka Squared is completely separate from Eureka. It's not just an update. It's, it's a, and you can still, Eureka is still an option if you guys had wanted to look into that, or is it being phased out? No, I believe it's still going to be, uh, it may be being phased out at some point, but um, 
No, it's still available. We could have stayed with that. We could have kept it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's not just, you know, um, it's not just an updated textbook. They've really, it has uh, different resources, different implementation, sequencing. different sequencing, different, all of it, it it's all been redone. So it's um, got the same name, but it's not just, you know, edition number two. Thank you. Peggy, do you have any questions? I don't. People have asked really good questions, so I've, I've got my questions answered. Thank you for asking, though. Peggy, I'm going to go buy a lottery approval, ticket after in this. It's great. Thank you both so very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Christine and Josh. So just as a matter of process for the board, uh, in the coming weeks, we would look to have a resolution for the board to formally act on adopting uh, this is a, a core resource for elementary math. Uh, that's to come, uh, along with the allocation. This is funded through textbook funds, which we get a state allocation for, uh, but that'll come before the board in the coming weeks. Great, thank okay. you so much. Uh, moving on to our Thanks. second special presentation. Great, Dr. Benante. those documents are. Thank you, Sean, and, and thanks for the community members who are present uh, for their patience. As I, I know class size is a topic of discussion that some folks are in attendance to hear more about tonight. Um, this really starts back to a uh, discussion we had had with the board uh, early on in the budget development process where we talk about class sizes or anticipated class sizes for the upcoming school year, which is not intended to be, uh, you know, a, a point of decision making for the school district, but more so a point of reflection for the board and for the administration to examine what our class sizes are, uh, how they range across the K-12 uh, program and uh, any influences that may need to be accounted for it through the budget development process. I've uh, shared in the past that in the absence of making a recommendation for the addition of teachers, that we manage class section allocations at the elementary separate from budget development, but yet both things are going on and discussions are going on around the same time. Uh, so, uh, you know, we've circled back to that. That certainly has caught the attention of uh, some members of our community, as well as our, our faculty and staff. And I've had an opportunity over the last month or so uh, to engage in further discussion with our classroom teachers around this. It's something as a board, we are with the board, I talked a little bit more about probably my first or second year here, uh, but that in subsequent years, other things have taken priority. We obviously were dealing with uh, a lot of health and safety related items as it relates to the pandemic, so maybe it's a good time to have come back to it. Uh, but. Um, that being said, I just want to share some base information, uh, share some thoughts that have come up in the conversations that I've had with staff. Uh, the board should have plenty of time then to discuss and, and ask good questions, and I know some community members probably want to make comment as well. So uh, just looking at the elementary level, these are our current class sizes. And I'll make the note for community members or anybody who may be watching this presentation. Uh, I know the screen uh, maybe looks good, but it's not necessarily viewable from where you may be sitting. If you happen to have a device, uh, this is loaded onto Board Docs, which can be accessed through our website where you can go into this presentation and see this information. Uh, I'll try my best to summarize in case uh, it's hard to see. Uh, these are the range of class sizes, kindergarten through fifth grade, the number of students uh, that we have in each cohort, the number of sections, which is the number of classes that we have currently set up at each of those grade levels, and what the class size average is. So you'll see that our cohort sizes range from 38, that's the lowest uh, number, uh, in kindergarten, all the way up to 60 currently in fourth grade. And the sections range, uh, primarily we have three sections at each grade level, with the exception of fifth grade, we have two sections. And therefore, our class uh, averages range, class size averages range from a low of 13 in kindergarten to a high of 20 in fifth grade. I've shared this with the board in the past just to provide some perspective. At the middle school level, we are teamed. There's four core teachers at each team. Uh, cohorts sizes range from 54 to 72. Class size averages range from 14 to 18 at the middle school. At the high school, 
uh, geography uh, uh, and global history. Our class sizes range around 19 or 20. Obviously, the scope of programming that is offered in the high school is uh, quite significant. Uh, it's far greater than what we see in the elementary school or the middle school. Uh, and the class sizes range quite significantly as well. I think looking at English gives you a broader perspective on how class sizes range in the high school as well. Uh, if you have a low of 12 in a particular class, highs of you know 20 or plus, 20 or more, we get into the upper 20s in some sections. We also get below 12 in some sections at the high school. Uh, when we're talking about singletons and we've prioritized having, again, a lot of uh, uh, elective opportunities or AP offerings for a small school. Uh, we will run classes with fewer than 10 students at the high school uh, as long as, again, there's no real significant implication or need um, uh, budgetarily to, to re-examine that, and there hasn't been over the past few years. So uh, this is just a, a scope of uh, English classes here, but there's other sections at the high school where you'll see fewer students than 12, and there's certainly classes or sections where you'll see more than 22. So some uh, folks talk about low class sizes at the elementary. I would say we have pretty low class sizes K-12 at Haldane generally. And we've, that's come through an investment that the board has supported over the years. Uh, again, and going back to what makes Haldane unique, those student-staff relationships uh, being an important part of our program, uh, keeping class sizes relatively low is an important part of that. It allows our teachers to provide a level of attention to our students, to their families, uh, uh, in their work together uh, throughout the K-12 program. <clears throat> so, uh, given our relatively small cohorts, and this is K-12, uh, but I think the issue of the day really is at the elementary, we realize a broad range of class sizes throughout our program. So we have cohorts, even our highest pro cohorts that are 70 or, or more students, we're still gonna realize low class sizes generally with, with cohorts of that size. We are projected to have lower cohort, relatively lower or smaller classes coming in than what we have elsewhere in our program. So if I can just go back for a second to this elementary class size, we're going to see in the future cohort sizes between 40 and 45 if our enrollment study were to hold true as compared to cohort sizes of 60. Um, so we're more likely to have uh, more consistent cohort sizes somewhere between the uh, range of 40 and 45 uh, in the classes that are subsequently going to come into Haldane uh, for kindergarten. Just want to make sure the board's aware of that. So, uh, you know, there's been some citations of research, and I'll just say, um, I think I've, I've read more class size research than most, and it's all over the place, uh, I'm going to be honest. There's some key studies that would be suggestive uh, or would suggest that lowering class sizes will have a positive impact on student achievement. Typically, uh, that is uh, uh, geared towards, in particular, lower income uh, communities. Uh, uh, there's studies that would suggest that lowering class sizes has um, minimal impact on, on student achievement. Um, so if you want to you know, go down the rabbit hole, I'll, I'll try to, you're welcome to. Uh, the Institute for Education Studies has a good search function where you can just punch in class size and you'll get a bunch of studies over the last 20 years on class size throughout our country. Uh, so it's hard to generalize where lower class sizes will be effective and, and where it may necessarily have no impact. Something that uh, researchers are mindful of is that resources are finite. So typically these studies are being entered into with the mindset, is it prudent for school districts or uh, other educational bodies, state uh, uh, education departments and such to invest money in lowering class sizes. It's human resource rich, which means it's expensive to do so. So as a broad strategy, to improve student achievement, lowering class sizes is validated to a degree, but also with the recognition that districts usually are, in, are only in a position where they can do so much to lower class size. I also think we have to take into consideration when we say, what is low class size? Each researcher enters into this with a different uh, point uh, or figure that they're considering. Generally, 20 
students in a class is considered a low class size. But relative for Haldane, 20 may actually be high. So we have to keep that in mind when we're looking at the academic literature on class size that having low class sizes is generally thought of as 20 or fewer students. Uh, whereas we, you know, in comparison to other grade levels may be saying, well, you know, 13 or 14 is low. Um, so our, our class sizes, as I shared in the past, are, low, are some of the lowest in the region. Our region is one of the more competitive regions, not just in the state, but in the country when it comes to this. Uh, so it's not always apples to apples when you're looking at academic research against what we have in place here at Haldane. What we have here in Haldane is actually reflective of a really high standard uh, for class size, um, uh, relatively speaking. Uh, something I want us to be mindful of uh, just in discussion, we typically experience four additional enrollees in grade one through the summer months, usually between this point in time and September 1. So that's something uh, you know, I've considered in, in some of the information that I'm going to share with you after the slide. Uh, I have been meeting with the elementary staff about this topic throughout the months of March and April. Uh, small group, whole group, small group again, uh, so we've gone through this a few times. And uh, the last topic was probably where we really coalesced around um, uh, a good base of information now to use in our planning moving forward. Uh, I feel that there's agreement between the, uh, myself, uh, Ms. Jammin, and uh, our elementary teachers that class sizes of 18 to 20 at the primary, which is grades three, uh, K through two, and 20 to 22 at the intermediate were appropriate guidelines or parameters in which to strive. And that's consistent, I would say, with the regional averages uh, uh, previous note on, you know, it being a, generally a, a very competitive region in this regard. Uh, that's consistent with what other competitive school districts in our region use as a basis for their planning. So if we were to look ahead uh, to next school year, Again, we have our projected uh, enrollment at each grade level. We do anticipate a kindergarten right around 48 uh, next year. Um, first grade, that kindergarten cohort moving up to first grade, uh, uh, current first grade cohort moving up to second grade. Again, so we're rolling up the other grade levels uh, there. Uh, if we were to remain at 17 sections, which is what we currently have uh, in place at the elementary school. There's 17 sections, 17 classes. Uh, if we were to keep 17 sections at the elementary level next year, uh, we would change our section allocation. So we would move a section from first grade to fifth grade if all things were to remain the same. And that's because we have that larger cohort of 60 students moving from fourth grade into fifth grade. So we only have two teachers there now. We're not going to have, we're not comfortable with two teachers teaching 30 students each. We feel that's far beyond what the standard is at Haldane. Uh, so we would move a section or a class, if you will, from first grade to fifth grade to further offset that. That keeps all of our averages and ranges within that, uh, or averages within the ranges I discussed with you previously, 18 to 20 uh, at the primary uh, and 20 to 22 at the intermediate. So some of the public discussion is, well, we're, we're raising class sizes, sort of. Class sizes would raise at first grade as a function of reallocating the sections in the elementary school. A little insider baseball, I know, but that's why the class sizes would conceivably be going up because the current kindergarten classes are around 13 or 14. And then when they go in the first grade, if we're moving a section, those classes are gonna to go to 19. If everything were to remain the same. If we were to move to 18 sections, so if we were to add a section in and put that section at first grade, uh, so every grade level now has three classes, our class sizes will obviously, um, would uh, at first grade would be smaller. They would be 13 uh, per class. That is not accounting for summer enrollees. Neither of these is. So as I mentioned, uh, if we're mindful of the fact that we average about four students who enroll, and again, that's a range. Some years we get two. One year we had nine. So 
just average that out over the last six years, we averaged to about four. Uh, and I would say that's like the mode uh, in that data set. Uh, well, then that's gonna pull those sections of 19, if everything were to remain the same, up to 21, 22. Now we're getting north of the uh, range we discussed with the teachers. Uh, the sections of 13 would become sections of uh, 14, 15 uh, or so there, if we were to add a section in there. And I think that's a key variable uh, when we talk to our teachers was, yeah, we're at 19 next year, but we always get more kids between this point and the summer. So, uh, which is reasonable, we do, that's, that's true. <clears throat> Remember, kindergarten is not required in New York State. So, uh, although I think most kindergartners are in some program or can, students who are eligible for kindergarten are either here or in a private option uh, or local option, but um, it's not uncommon for school districts to pick up students going into a first grade uh, through one function or another. Students are transitioning out of private kindergarten programs into a public option or students who remain home uh, or some sort of maybe daycare setting, setting uh, are now enrolling in first grade. Uh, I can't look at the uh, elementary matter without considering the middle school matter because I alluded to this back in, in February uh, where I was candid in that it really should come from existing staffing if we were to make any shift in this area because we have elementary certified teachers who are teaching in the middle school um, and we have a small cohort of students, relatively small cohort of students in fifth grade right now moving up to the middle school. Um, that being said, uh, uh, long term it is going to force a conversation for us to have and it's a good one around what that teaming structure looks like at the middle school. Um, I just don't think while we're able to sustain it right now as it currently exists, it, 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 it's resources that we could distribute elsewhere in the district, arguably expand programming if we were to rethink teaming a little bit uh, at the middle school uh, levels because it is resource rich, uh, if you will. And we're gonna have cohorts of 40 to 45 making their way up into teams with four teachers that's gonna equate to an average class size of 10, 11, or 12. Um, Teaming, just to clarify, allows for one teacher to specialize uh, in continuity instruction. Um, uh, so we have the four core teachers, math, science, social studies, ELA, uh, at each of the grade levels, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. Uh, I mentioned the class sizes likely at the middle school are gonna become very low in future years uh, if we uh, don't rethink this. Yet, teaming is important. Uh, our middle school was created uh, it did not exist forever. Uh, our middle school was created with teaming as a core facet of the model. So as I was considering maybe moving a sixth grade teacher down, uh, some of that does strike in opposition of the identity of, uh, of the school and how the program in the school was created when we decided years ago to create Haldane Middle School, which we didn't always have a Haldane Middle School. Um, so that's something that I think was, was quite significant in our discussions and quite frankly would have led to another series of potential concerns on the part of our community and why I'm not recommending to the board that we move a sixth grade teacher down uh, into fifth grade and leave first grade where it is. The long-term question though is how can we best maintain elements of teaming while effectively deploying our staff because uh, when it was initially designed, our cohort sizes were much larger than what they're going to be now in the future. So we, it is time to re-engage our staff, our middle school staff and our community to a degree in a discussion around what should teaming really look like in future years. It's good, it's very supportive of our kids, it works really well, but at the same time, it's going to prevent us from doing other things uh, that we could be doing for our kids. So just looking at our options uh, moving forward, uh, we are in a position now as the state budget's been finalized. You may recall I was uh, quite outspoken about uh, what was uh, listed as a uh, mandatory set aside of $100,000 for high impact tutoring. That's out of the budget now, so, uh, so that's good. But that would have been $100,000 that would have, we would have had to direct in a very particular way. Uh, that's now just included in our, uh, uh, our allocation of state aid. Um, so the budget can support uh, the addition of another elementary teacher, the budget can support that. It could support another teacher 
in a variety of areas. We have enough money available in the budget that we're putting before the community to support another teaching position, I should say that. If we want to prioritize that to the elementary, we can do so. We can hold the position, meaning not do necessarily anything in terms of committing the funding uh, yet, uh, for if and when our enrollment increases through the later months. So if we were to say, well, that range right now is within what we define as our, our target area. Um, let's wait and see if we actually get those uh, summer enrollees and hire a teacher at that point. I would say we don't want to wait too long for that uh, because hiring a teacher in August is, is not advisable. Uh, remember, we're trying to create class uh, sections. We're notifying our families of uh, who, uh, what classes the students are going to be in. But we can decide just to hold for a period of time, I would say until uh, June 30th, no later than July 15th, and make a determination at that point. That way, uh, our families um, can be notified in ample time who their child's classroom teacher is. Uh, we could do that. We could hire a teacher or post for a position now uh, or after the budget passes uh, if we felt that was more prudent. Uh, in the event that enrollment doesn't increase, so it just stays right where it is, uh, or increases much later in the summer. Sometimes you get an influx of students the week before school. Uh, we can hire additional TAs to support the two sections at first grade. Uh, that's an option that some districts take uh, as well in doing that. That is an option that would work for us here. Uh, we still, even though I, I'm not advising this, we could move an elementary certified teacher who's currently in the middle school down to the elementary school, but it would disrupt the learning model at the middle school. Um, and we can make no changes. We can just stay where we are. Uh, I would encourage us to consider uh, the first option here uh, or the second, um, but because uh, we have the avail availability to um, as compared to the third or, or the fourth. I, um, at this point. So uh, I'll pause there. I think that's plenty of information to get the conversation started with the board. I'll stay up here uh, to answer any questions that the board may have and the board may just want to talk to each other on this. Oh. Peter is very happy that uh, you just concluded his little Got success it. sound. Thank you, Dr. Bernante, for a very- I've reached my uh, word limit. <laughs> What's that? That's the alarm that goes off when I've reached my word limit. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Text limit. I always do voice of speech. I uh, um, I, I, um, thank you for a very comprehensive overview of many questions that have been put to us, both sort of here in a public forum, but also I think through emails and otherwise. Sure. Um, I, I, um, I mean, I certainly have my own questions. I want to put them first. I don't know if anyone else has anything top of mind. My, I guess my chief question might be, um, say that um, if we were to not budget, say currently, we're going to think, say option two, or are we, we would keep the, the current cohort of first grade teachers as is and be adding uh, in the upper level, right? That, that's the plan is actually we'd be adding an elementary school teacher probably to that larger fifth grade Correct. and keeping the first, that, that's the plan. Where you where we found this money, like it was yeah. The, the so high impact a couple different points in the budget. And where was that going? If not, if we decide sure. not to add a third first grade section. Sure. Uh, so one area was we uh, we had a tuition request uh, that when we initially developed the budget was not factored in, uh, but the board. Uh, met on that so that's a that's a level of funding that uh, an additional student whose uh, uh, family is willing to pay tuition to come in that's twenty thousand dollars that uh, was not factored into our initial budget projections but came through and then uh, as we go through and uh, further go into the budget development process uh, even through the months of uh, March and April as we go through we continue to uh, become more clear uh, in other planning areas where you know we have projections or whatnot, uh, we're always budgeting conservatively and we see that we can make uh, further adjustments to, and in this case, to support the addition of a salary. Uh, I will say that in some of those areas, it will be tighter than uh, we have had in previous years. You know, uh, uh, something like um, uh, uh, benefits. Uh, we see, we, or I'm sorry, uh, when we hire additional teachers, we project that we're going to have hire a teacher at a particular step or we give ourselves a range uh, as we go out and um, 
uh, hire a teacher uh, that we may end up falling lower than what we had anticipated or what we had budgeted on that salary. So we're in the process right now where we're hiring teachers and we're seeing, well, we had budgeted for this at a particular level, but we actually found a really good candidate who was just out of college and we can hire at step one, even though maybe we had budgeted or anticipated that we were going to need to hire a teacher or be prepared to hire a teacher somewhere between step five and step 10, especially for a more competitive or a, uh, an area that uh, you don't have as many uh, candidates in a math or a science related mm -hmm. uh, position in particular. So we've benefited just from going further along and saying, well, we were prepared to actually go up to this level on this particular teacher, but we benefited from having a really good candidate uh, at a lower level. That's just another example. Then the related benefits are lower uh, as well. Um, so uh, that's just to give you an idea. And, and with that, quite frankly, those two things, you're almost halfway there. Um, uh, and then there's just some other areas of the budget um, under um, uh, uh, curriculum development. We see we can make some adjustments there, even though we were planned to do, uh, not interfere with the work that we were planned to do that uh, Josh and Christine spoke to. Um, there, there, there's some additional funding there that we, we, we felt we could uh, put aside for a salary if needed. Um, and then there were some other uh, uh, adjustments that we had made. Um, with the creation of the special K through two class that yes. we're gonna that we're gonna that's proposed, um, does that impact the current class sizes at all? So, so kids mm. next year, first and second grade, are we taking? And I think I've heard this answer before, but are we taking any of those kids from first and second grade to be put in that special class? And will that impact? No, uh, those are all kindergartners that are anticipated to be in that class. Uh, those students, maybe not initially, but will push in to other kindergarten classes for portions of their day. Uh, so they'll be in the, the, the K-2 special class, and they may go out for special or morning meeting, and ideally, you know, greater portions of their day will spent, be spent in other kindergarten classes. Uh, but there's no first or second graders right now that are anticipated to be in the special class. Okay. And are there any, you know, is there anything explicit to this cohort that you've heard from the kindergarten teachers that, you know, makes this different from any other cohort, especially the fourth going into fifth grade, that's really large, relatively speaking? Uh, yes and no. I'm sorry, I'm not going to give you as direct an answer as you may want. I think every cohort's unique, and when I meet with our teachers, uh, and they certainly get to know our students really well, and, and each cohort respectfully presents uh, uh, some really unique strengths and some really unique challenges. Um, with respect to our kindergartners, uh, some things I've heard, uh, one, uh, our teachers are really proud of the growth that they've made throughout this school year. And they feel that part of that has been driven by the fact that they've been able to provide a high level of uh, small group and individual attention. Uh, I do think that our primary age learners uh, currently that we have and some of the groups that we will have uh, coming up through, we do have to be mindful of any uh, pandemic related influence on them because uh, those are the students that were most uh, potentially at greatest risk of not meeting certain developmental milestones, uh, especially as it relates to speech and language. Um, yeah. Uh, as other students may have been, because their social interactions were limited. Uh, and uh, really, a child's growth and development is occurring at all times on their K-12 journey, but that period through the, the primary years and really the, you know, your infancy all the way through is a time of rapid uh, speech and language development uh, that could be influ or, uh, uh, negatively influenced if you don't have the range of opportunities uh, that maybe would otherwise have been available to you. We don't know that for sure. Uh, uh, you know, we don't know what opportunities our kids have or didn't have, but I know that's something that we are, are keeping a close eye on as students are entering into our program. And it's something that our kindergarten teachers anecdotally felt uh, with the group coming in this school year, that they did demonstrate a, 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 a great greater need in that particular area socially, um, uh, and some of that manifest uh, in, in what, how we would have benchmarked them in the areas of speech and language and, and, and literacy. Um, every cohort is different. Um, yes. What are you, which, you know, we all know, um, are you expecting, or what is the expected additional enrollees um, in the fourth going into fifth grade? 
So when we do the enrollment study, it's a good question. I don't have the, the full study available tonight, but part of the enrollment study actually takes uh, uh, an examination of how many new students do you typically receive each school year at each grade level. We typically see a large influx at two areas, uh, kindergarten going into first and uh, eighth grade going into ninth. The eighth grade to going into ninth is pretty evident because we have students who tuition in and we have a relationship with the school that does that. Kindergarten into first is the other area where you'll see a more significant increase in that area. Uh, the enrollment study will though map that out. There's a term for it uh, that they use, but essentially it's a rate uh, that they establish of how many students do you average uh, receiving or losing uh, at any particular uh, grade level each year? What is your historical average in that regard? I provided you with the information for first. It, 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 we average around four new students. Um, I don't uh, just recall off of memory it being a significant figure at any other grade level aside from um, uh, eighth going into ninth uh, mm -hmm. for the relationship that we have with Garrison. There are years, that being said, where we see just odd things. Uh, I think there was a year if Ms. Javin was here. Was it third grade? It's the current fourth, current the current fourth, fourth grade, grade. Last summer. A bunch of third graders showed up in the summertime. Yeah. I don't know why that was. Yeah. Uh, but it was just, you know, you see that every now and then. But that's not, uh, I would say that's not typical. And, you know, just sort of my last comment yeah. slash question is, um, you know, it's, it's amazing to have. I think we're, we're very fortunate that not only we have some, these small classes that the, the district recognizes that and sort of strives for that. But, you know, it's not equitable, right, across. Every cohort's different. Um, and I know I'm starting to hear a little bit of these fourth grade parents. You know, they, the, the fourth grade parents, the fourth grade sections that are pushing up at 20, you know, all, I think all three classes have 20 in them. Um, and that's a, that's a grade, that's a cohort with um, a very large spectrum of, of learning differences as well. Um, so, you know, what's not to say that if, if we heard you know, from a significant portion of those parents, they want these lower yeah. class sizes. They want another section added. Yep, I get it. Uh, I would point to the fact that our class sizes are low in every area of our program. Um, so, you know, and, and I've even said in the past, Maggie, and you know this, I think there's a point where too low is, there is such a thing as too low uh, when it comes to the social dynamic within a classroom environment. Uh, you want enough kids in the class for the kids to have a rife social uh, experience that's not only good for them socially, it's good for them academically as well. When you think of the language acquisition, um, we want kids, in particular at the primary level, to be engaging with one another. Um, uh, it's really important part of their program, so I, you need to have enough kids in order uh, for that to be a rife experience for them. Uh, as far as the equitable, I would say um, the system should be designed to provide, you know, it's not all, again, I think appropriate comparisons. Our class sizes, if anywhere, should be, if they're gonna be lower, they should be lower in the primary. Um, uh, but I'd also encourage us to think about other supports that we have in place for our students that are designed uh, on a basis of equity to provide some kids with more than other kids. Uh, our academic intervention structure, and we have a number of staff members who provide academic intervention support, is designed to only be providing some students with additional support, not all students with additional support. And the basis of that is equity, that some students need more uh, support uh, in language arts and mathematics in order to reach grade level standards and so then as compared to some of their peers. Um, uh, uh, there's other program opportunities that our students have later on in the system when it comes to electives uh, that, again, is reflective of where they are developmentally in their experience uh, in learning in our school. Uh, our, our high school has a number of more elective opportunities than our middle school. Well, that's because our students are at a point of greater independence. Uh, they're starting to uh, commit to various uh, uh, interests, uh, uh, and our programming reflects that more so than it would at the, at the middle school and certainly at the elementary school. So I, I certainly hear you. I, I would say if our class sizes uh, at the upper intermediate level were 28, 29, 30, and they were 
13, 14, 15 at the primary, I would say, of course, we got to do something about that. But generally, we're falling right around that 20 mark. And uh, we have an opportunity to make the primary even lower. Um, uh, and if that's something that uh, you know, we feel is appropriate to keep the kids who are currently in this kindergarten model uh, in a very similar model through first grade, we do have the ability to do that or we have the ability to provide supplementary support to those classrooms uh, in the event that those uh, um, uh, additional students come in uh, later. I would, oh. Oh. okay. Peggy, you go ahead, you go. Yeah, okay, oh, thanks, Ezra. So um, I have a couple of points that I wanna make. I think mostly I'm making points. I may have some questions, we'll see. So. <laughs> Dr. Bernante, in his presentation, you know, rightly said that there's some research that suggests that smaller class size is beneficial. You know, another way to say that is there's other research that shows that class size doesn't make a big difference. Can you hear me okay? That's one yep. question I, I asked. We can hear you fine. Megan, would you mind okay. turning her up a little so, bit? <laughs> I would Just also say that, I mean, my understanding of the research is that people have really moved away from class size research because we recognize that while, yes, extremes of class size may make a difference, what really matters for children's educational and social emotional outcomes is instruction, right? Like what happens in the classroom? and. And so changes, you know, you can have a small class size and not great instruction. And that, I mean, I think to some extent, it's why the research on class size has been really mixed is because focusing just on class size is missing this critically important component of schooling, which is what teachers are doing in their classroom. So that if you take that another step further, right? So I understand that, um, you know, for lots of reasons, you know, the parents of the rising first graders, you know, have real, you know, legitimate concerns about what their children's educational experience has been so far and really wanting them for lots of really good reasons to have a really solid first grade experience. And their rationale for having these smaller classes is to increase their, the, the, hopefully, you know, improved instruction. So I guess what I would say then is so to bring in, being a first grade teacher is really, really hard, right? Like it would require us going and hiring a first grade teacher. And, and I would suggest, you know, I've spent lots and lots and lots and lots of time in the past couple of years in first and second grade classrooms. And even when you have really good new, I mean, I guess we could have an experience first grade teacher come in, right? And so they wouldn't necessarily be new, but you'd still have a teacher coming in and being new to our curricula, being new to our school system. And I'm not sure, I guess what I wanna, I guess the point I'm wanting to make is, I'm not 100% sure that bringing in a new teacher and making class size sm so smaller and having a new teacher is, is necessarily going to lead to the desired outcome. And so, I mean, I don't know, Dr. Benanti, the extent to which you were asking for input on the options, but, you know, to me, I mean, unless there was a huge influx of children going into the first grade, like really what we would want to do would be set up a situation so that our teachers that we have here with us, right, who are, you know, familiar with our school and familiar with our students would be, you know, to provide them with the support to provide the kinds of differentiated and small group instruction that we believe might be, you know, we anticipate would be the most beneficial, um, you know, the most beneficial for those students. Um, and so anyway, that's a lot of words to say that I'm not convinced as someone who knows a fair amount about, you know, early education, that, that bringing in a new teacher will necessarily have the intended you know, would necessarily have the intended, um, you know, have the in necessarily the intended outcome. Yeah. And, and I just want to. Oh, and I, the last thing I wanted to say, sorry, is like as a as a as a as a board member, right? Like looking across all the grades, I don't. It certainly. 
you know, I think kind of building on some of the things that Maggie was saying, it's not, you, you know, uh, achieving class sizes that small is not um, a priority. It's, it's something I guess I better said, I think might say, is, is a little bit concerning to me, right? Like moving to this model where there, where our class sizes, which, is, which are already very small, or not very small, but already, already quite small, and certainly live within the realms of what, you know, our own teachers think are appropriate, I, I'm not sure making them even smaller is actually um, a direction that we want to go in with one last caveat, but obviously making sure that the teachers have the support they need to provide the kinds of instruction that will be most beneficial for those students. Yeah, and I, I may have uh, spoken too soon earlier about where the section would be, and, and Ms. Jammond, correct me if I'm wrong, we, we wouldn't necessarily have to hire a new oh, okay. teacher at first I didn't, grade. I didn't understand we that. could hire a teacher at fifth grade. At fifth yeah. Grade. Um, I, I'm, you know, looking at the chart of what I project next year to be, uh, and there being two sections at first grade, but we can keep three sections at first grade, hire the teacher at the upper elementary level. Um, Wait, so uh, I don't understand where would a third, third, first grade teacher come from? We then? currently have three in first grade. Sorry, I couldn't hear. We, we currently, currently have, have three. three in first grade. Oh, currently has three. Yeah, okay. I, just a, in, in anticipation, if we were to keep 17 sections next year, we have a larger cohort in fourth grade going into fifth. We would move a section there if we were to keep everything the same. That's where we would only have two in first grade. But if we're able to fund another section, I would keep, uh, I would address that by hiring another fifth grade teacher uh, to address okay. that fourth grade. I court. still stand by my point that I, I don't think that smaller class size necessarily leads to better instruction. Correct. Yeah. And you are, it's as good as the quality of the teacher in the room. Um, I have a small question and a, a easy question and a hard question, or maybe a more strategic question. Easy question is, and I know the answer is going to be it depends, but I got to at least ask. When do we generally know how many students, incremental students, are going to get in first grade? How many students? What? How many incremental students are going to join our first grade cohort? Ooh, uh, it ranges. So, I'm right. sorry. Well, uh, yeah. Uh, some, right, fine. We fine. do our best to try to get word out and roll your kids, yeah. right? Uh, you, you've seen those communications from yeah. us already, but John, it can be all the way up until the last week, the week before school. Yeah. Legally, they don't need to tell. They can just show up and roll. Okay. All right. Larger question, um, we have the budget. I'm going to set aside the question of class sizes, basically entirely. And we have the budget to hire, albeit tight on a number of other dimensions, to hire an incremental teacher. Longer term, I would not expect us to continue to have 18 sections in K through 5. Yeah. We're going to gain a per, an FTE mm -hmm. from or a couple in there. Is it better for us to hire? Like, how does growing headcount now benefit us five years from now? When you say headcount, you mean teaching? Teaching, headcount? teaching staff. Sure. Like, uh, is there some? Is it strategically beneficial for us to get somebody? Are there people looking, or can we get a better quality candidate who we can nurture for a longer period of time who's more flexible? I like talking I think there's that. that. There's a piece there. We're going to turn over staff, yep. and we know that we're coming upon a time where our staff profile is such that generally we have a staff that's getting older. Yeah. They're going to be retiring, yeah. and we're going to be hiring similar to what we're doing this year. Right. Um, we would best be served by, if we were to add the staff here, uh, not just hiring a teacher that's a general education certified yeah. elementary, but also has either a special education certification or a reading certification, yeah. because there's a high likelihood that staff member is going to re be redeployed in one of those two areas, uh, if not next year, shortly thereafter. And, just, and we will need them. And just being uh, like my perception, and you can tell, you can correct mm -hmm. me, you, maybe not in a public forum, but in some other forum. My perception is that we've been able, a lot of the newer teachers coming in, certainly in the time that I've been paying a lot of attention, have been really high quality. And I was wondering whether we are 
differentially able to hire, capture good quality teaching candidates at this, I don't know, like, yeah. is there something to that? I don't know if the, if we could just talk about it as a market, if yeah. you will. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I don't have a, a good enough sense. I, th I agree with you. I think over the last five years that we've had together, uh, we've benefited from having just exceptional teachers that we've been able to bring in right. and the years prior to that right. as well. Yeah, but absolutely. I can only speak for uh, the time that I've been here. And I also feel really good about our processes for recruitment uh, and uh, retention in that regard. And uh, I think uh, there's really good candidates out there and we're in a position where we've been finding them or they've been attracted to Haldane uh, for a variety of reasons. And uh, uh, I can't say though with certainty yeah. that seize the opportunity this year because there's this great crop of yeah. uh, potential teachers out there that won't be there next year. Right. I don't know that uh, to be true. We work closely, uh, I have a good rapport through the teacher center with other local universities uh, uh, that have teacher centers, whether it be New Paltz or Marist, uh, Mercy, some of the others uh, in the region. And uh, there's good candidates there. And uh, I think through having a director of human resources and having right. an established building team, we're getting good candidates in. But just circling back, I think the most in, uh, significant piece around the question that you asked is we're going to need teachers in the years to come even if we don't maintain 18 uh, sections there's a way to structure a hire here that would not only address maybe uh, an immediate area but will serve us uh, in other ways um, uh, as long as we hire the right teacher with the right credentials to that point Phil and I'm gonna first off I'm gonna thank Peggy for taking the lead on a uh, being an educational researcher and suggesting, <laughs> you know, she's got the data and the facts behind it. You were about to tee off on something that I actually find important from a management standpoint, okay? You suggested that by maintaining lower class sizes, you are filling, kind of backfilling in using other aspects of the budget, and you had mentioned that in hiring processes, you then may have to remove some money off of the table. So here's a question for you. Does or would the maintaining of our lower class sizes and our desire to do that then handcuff you in what you just suggested you wanted which was I want a better candidate I think it depends on the area in which we're looking and this is where there is a bit of a market influence so I'll just give you an example um, typically we would struggle to find uh, the relative pool I would say for science and mathematics it tends to be much smaller than uh, you would see in general education, yeah. uh, special education to a degree, um, and uh, reading. We just, uh, we have one on the agenda tonight who is still in the audience, a science teacher uh, that we're going to hire this evening uh, with your support. Um, that I think was unanticipated in that it didn't require us to go out and try to find somebody who was, had 10 years of experience mm -hmm. in, another, in another district and maybe lure them away. Um, similarly with math, I interviewed our math finalist uh, and while there's still some things to work out uh, in the coming days with that, I feel good about the math candidate I anticipate bringing before you in a couple of weeks. Uh, two people who just rose up to the top, had nothing to do with budget, they're just the best people for Haldane right now. And um, we were not in a position where we had to, uh, certainly where this influenced that, we wouldn't allow it uh, to, because we want the best teachers in. I think if we were to hire an elementary teacher, just full circle on your question, mm -hmm. I, I don't anticipate the same potential constraints on the hiring of that individual, given what the pools tend to be in elementary general ed, special education, uh, and reading to a point. Um, gotcha. And that's because we have good prep programs locally uh, and there's good candidates in those programs. Um, whereas finding a science or a math teacher, just the pools just aren't as big, uh, right. you know, uh, uh, typically. We don't have as many people going into it, not sure. as many people coming out of the programs that are local or elsewhere. Yeah, an element of the question is, is based around 
as a manager, you look at um, what entices people yes. to actually come here. Yeah. One is class size. Yes, for yes. sure. No doubt. But one's also how much they how much bread they make. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's reality. There's a fair balance in that, yeah. um, Ezra. It's a good point. And, you know, we meet with a lot of candidates, and it just happens to be front and center right now because uh, some candidates we do find are experienced in another district and are willing to sacrifice a little bit on salary because they want to come into a community that's really supportive of its schools. Uh, maybe they don't feel like they have that uh, where they are. Um, one of those percent things they pick up on too, because they all do demo lessons, they all see our kids, they come to experience uh, a little bit about who we are and what the class uh, uh, sizes are here. And um, yeah, I think uh, we've heard from candidates for sure that they feel at Haldane, they're in a better position maybe uh, to, to do the work that they aspired to do. Uh, when they first envisioned going into teaching. And some of that is driven by the class sizes that they uh, experience when they're with us. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, speaking of, uh, as a parent of a child in one of those fourth to fifth grade class, my, I'm glad to hear you bringing up student profile in one way or another because I feel like I'm encouraged to hear that you had a conversation with the Court of Students Elementary School about you know what they are, are, are teachers at the elementary school about what they feel they feel a comfortable number of students might be um, it sort of as a threshold but student profile makes a big difference it does. you know and, and it uh, and that we have the ability to take that into consideration as we're thinking about how we distri distribute our students I think is is really key because my son alone takes up four or five kids so like one kid could be a one-to-one -one, some are not apples to apples um, but um, I, I think this has been a great opportunity for you to have. It's what seems to me a, a conversation that's needed to happen um, at the elementary school level for some time that's really going to be encouraging moving forward as we start to think about the space and what our space needs are and what the master scheduling plan, sort of how that evolves. I think all of these things, we're poised in one way or another to have a meaningful conversation yeah, about that. I think the that parameters the and the fact that we have consensus, and I shared this in previous meetings, my, my reluctance to go too far into a staffing discussion before we even had agreement with the staff of well what do you think is reasonable yeah right otherwise we're just we're, we're throwing ideas out there without really having consensus between uh the leadership and our faculty around what are we even striving for in this is it just becoming a, a discussion about class size with no real point of reference to, to lean on but i think we came to that quite quickly i think yeah. we were all in agreement <laughs> yeah 18 to 20 20 to 22 that's uh, those are fair targets. One thing, because if staff members watch this, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention this, that the staff appropriately brought up was that the aid support and TA support that's yeah. available in the elementary school has been reduced uh, yeah, over the last yeah. five years. Um, and that's at my recommendation uh, to avoid teacher layoffs. Yeah. Um, so not every budget picture, as you know, uh, it shapes up kind of as smoothly as they have right. the last two years. Right. Um, we didn't get significant state aid increases, uh, our levy limit, you know, fluctuates. So there have been years where I've recommended in lieu of, uh, and it's, it's a difficult recommendation to make, but in lieu of laying off staff members of reducing class section allocations at the elementary or in other parts of our program, we've reduced aids and we've reduced TAs. Yeah. So the kindergarten teacher who has, uh, I'm just gonna arbitrary number, 18 students in her class, uh, in 2023, who had 18 students in her class seven years ago, well, seven years ago, she might have had a full-time aide or TA in that class, and now she may have only uh, part-time aide support. Uh, or the first grade teacher maybe had full-time aide support, and now they don't have any. Um, or they have very little. Mm -hmm. So I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that, that that was also a factor in the discussion. And also, in comparing to other local schools, I have what their class size ranges are. I didn't ask about TA, supplemental mm. support, aid supp supplemental support. I'm sure it's there. Um, so that's just something else we have to be mindful of in the spirit of supporting more direct instruction and small group instruction. Our aides and our TAs play a role in that. Yeah. And uh, we've just been in some tough budgets where we haven't been able to support the level of funding for those positions uh, that um, uh, we maybe had in, in previous years. Did you talk a bit about that? Did you get specific about like how many TAs per however many students over the desired number or? With our staff? Yeah. No. no. So we're not ready to talk about that in terms no. of what? Yeah. No. 
Again, if it was available, I just in full candor, my recommendation would be to bias it towards the, the younger grade levels. Uh, that being said, that was considering if we do go class sizes as low as 13, I don't know, maybe that's a different conversation. Uh, yeah. Maybe we would uh, redistribute that differently. But that wasn't something we, in the time that we had, and we spent a lot of time on this, we were able to get down to uh, TAs um, or AIDS uh, distribution. So that's, I mean, that's a, that's a really, really important point. I mean, I think I sat on, you know, I was part of those budget decisions. Like there were years, uh, I mean, especially after the tax cap was first put in place where um, it was very, very difficult um, to find ways to develop a budget that met that tax cap. And there were ways that we were able to find efficiencies that didn't involve reducing the total number of staff. But then there were definitely years, and, and those were the places that were cut. I mean, that, you know, I feel a little self conscious. You know, I said, I think, a, you know, or thought at least a couple of times, like, you know, there were. There were definitely years, right, where there were, were actually, you know, 22, 23 students in the early primary grades. But, but Dr. Benante raises a really good point that there, that there were, um, I think, well, for the most part, teacher aides in those classes. Maybe they were also teaching assistants. But it, again, I mean, I, you know, it, I guess I want to restate the point I was making <laughs> just a little bit. You know, the, the issue is absolutely providing the right kinds of instructional, you know, support for students and to make sure that the classroom, you know, the lead instructor the, uh, in the class is, 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 is supported so that, you know, he or she can do that. Um, and I just want us to think about, you know, the, you know, the best way to do that. And I, I guess the point I wanted to, you know, to make is, you know, we have, we have teachers that are, and I, I'll be honest, I'm not following exactly how this, this, how the staffing would happen to bring in the third first grade teacher. And I don't know if it's important to go into those details right now, but, um, but you know, we right now we have. Um, yeah, just making sure that those teachers have the support so that they can provide the kinds of instruction that students need. I think, and if there are no other questions, I think that uh, I think do we have we can move on. Do we have aides in the kindergarten classroom all day long? That used to be a uh, thing. How much time, yeah. Christine, that used if you to don't be a mind? Thing, right? Great. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Benante. <laughs> First of all, uh, two things. Uh, if the board would like to hear, I'd imagine there might be a few individuals who want to provide public comment. Um, so before making a decision, I'm curious if you'd like to hear the public comment, and then we can come back to this during uh, discussion. Okay. Um, uh, and go from there okay, if that's perfect. something that uh, might do, be it's more like next, what do we do now next right. steps okay great all right so we're moving on to okay. communication from the public and this is our opportunity to address any special presentation the last two that have come up i'm going to read my pair i'm excited i'm gonna let you know i'm excited because usually i read this paragraph and there's no one there to come up so it's amazing um, the Haldane Board of Education desires and values input from the entire school community. The first public comment session is reserved for comments on any special presentations or active agenda items. For those who wish to address the board, please sign in and state your name for the record. Please keep your remarks to three minutes or less. Disparaging remarks and discussion of district personnel are strongly discouraged. Although we do not engage in dialogue, we are listening. Please leave your contact information with our district clerk, Megan Shields, for a prompt follow-up from the board president or Dr. Benante. So is there anyone that would like to come up and speak? Great. Come sign in. Just so oh, that's right. We need you. <laughs> No, no, it's okay. I've, I, you, I should know it by now, but I have to read it every time myself. I I forget, so. Hi. 
My name is Stacia Casillo. My daughter is in kindergarten here. And I guess the only statement or comment I have, and I think you did start to address it, but I just want to emphasize, we talk a lot about research and um, how kids in the past have done. We are in a post-pandemic era. These kids have experienced things and our families that no one else has experienced. And I really want that to be taken into consideration when we talk about whether it's quality of teachers, what the children need. You made a very good point, or the teachers made a really good point that I just, I would love more information on, the kindergarten teachers, that they're seeing issues with these children. I want to know if they've seen them in the past, um, to what extent, the interventions that have been provided, um, how helpful have they been, and how we can continue to ensure these kids get the support and interventions. Um, I don't know long term what this is going to look like. I think we're only seeing the, the top of the iceberg with how this is impact kids. I'm a child psychologist. I see it every day. So I just want to make sure that we are thinking really about not just next year, but big picture. We're going to see issues arising every year. And um, I want to make sure we have the support and the staff that we are addressing that. That's all. Great. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just had a follow-up question to your options that you proposed, um, which I just want to say I appreciate you finding options. Mm -hmm. um, you said something about keeping the class size as is and adding TAs or aides. My two questions for that are, does, is that assuming that it's going to be two classes or the, the three that we currently have for first grade? And you mentioned you can have TAs or aides. Which one is it? Is it all day? How many will there be in each classroom? Like that's it sure. seems a little vague sure. to me. Those are my uh, yeah, yeah. Be, yes. those are my follow-up uh, questions. It would be uh, with the assumption that there was only two sections, hiring aides to further offset um, or further enable the teacher and the aide to work in a smaller. Uh, um, small group environment with the students. So that's if there's not a third section. If there was only two sections, we could, uh, and we were in a point where we couldn't add a section because it's too late. Uh, that's if we were to wait into the summer and see what, what happens with enrollment. Um, we're in a position where we can hire aides or TAs. I would recommend TAs just because you can deploy TA, teaching assistants right. versus teacher aides. Right. Um, uh, our teaching assistants are certified. Um, some teaching assistants have uh, teaching certificates themselves. Uh, and maybe it's a good pathway, if you will, into a teaching position. Uh, but generally, uh, I would recommend that we hire TAs. The cost, the relative cost is similar. So um, I would look to hire TAs as opposed to aides. So it would be two classrooms for the incoming first grade with the recommendation of a full-time TA in each classroom. I just want to clarify um, that our options are such where we could hire another teacher. So that's one option. If we don't hire another teacher, we could hire teaching assistants or aides. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there's some offshoots to that. If we're going to wait to hire another teacher to see if any additional students come in, and that happens late. Uh, while we're not always in the best position to get a good teaching candidate late in the summer, we could hire and seek to hire TAs at that point. Uh, that's a potential option for us. Um, but if we were to hire a teacher, I would not be recommending higher aid support in right. addition to that. I just want right. to make sure that's clear. But if you were to hire that teacher, that teacher would then go to the fifth grade. You would keep the, th you would keep three, the three current teachers First where grade. they are in the first grade, Correct. right? Okay. Correct. 
Yeah, I think I may have confused that when yeah. someone had asked early on where the hire would be. So uh, there's not a need to hire a first grade teacher because there's currently three teachers in first grade. Right, right. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. Hi, Kristen Sherman. Thanks for having me. I have um, two kids at Haldane. We've had an overall very positive experience, and I think I want to say to start that you know we have a tremendous amount of fidelity in the board and the administrators here, and so whatever decision is made ultimately, we know will be in the best interest of the students, and we very much appreciate that. Um, one comment that I did just want to put out for thought, which was brought up in one of the um, uh, board members. Reaction is around, you know, the quality or the, the, the stature of the instruction provided. And as I think about my, my children and their classes and the experiences that we've had um, with other students, overall, such a wonderful community that we're a part of. Um, but I would just ask us to consider is the instruction, is, is the delivery and the ability of the student to intake that instruction impacted by these ratios? Um, are they, I, I agree, and we have wonderful strong teachers, um, but their ability for the messaging to actually be impactful to the students, I do think is tremendously, especially at these younger ages, um, especially for um, as we've talked about these kids who have had maybe a, a less traditional um, entry path to where they are now in kindergarten, is, is that impacted? So again, appreciate the opportunity to have this conversation. I would also say, you know, some of the options that were presented tonight, I think are very interesting. And, you know, luckily I was informed that, you know, this is an open <laughs> forum for us to come to. Um, but I would encourage you as well to consider the communication vehicle for which this is presented back to the community um, in a way that's really supportive of, of our students and, um, and the families that are involved as well. So that's all. Great. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Great. Great. All right. Moving on. Right. Or, or, do, or are we going to we're going to save a conversation until well, we have the board reflection process. Okay. Uh, we, we can also add it as an item under uh, new business discussion. I guess my question might be, is there any action to be taken this evening? I think the administ me <laughs> needs to know just to get and get a sense from the board of the options that were outlined tonight. Is there a particular direction you would like me to pursue? Great. And do we all collectively feel like we are prepared to um, provide that feedback this evening? I, I, no. you're not, you're not no. yet ready. I'm just gonna say no. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. I, I want to think about it a little bit. Great. I think that that's that's that should have be the case. Have a magic eight ball that could shake and say I, I'm, yeah. I'm, in, I'm in a particular, <laughs> but I want to think about it. I want to at least sleep on it. Great. How about that? That makes sense to me, Peggy. Um, no, I think it makes sense. I mean, I think, I think it makes sense to, 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 to wait. Um, I realize, um, yeah, I think it makes sense to wait. Great. So then perhaps once we get to your comments at the end, you can frame what the next step might look like. Sure. For us. That's yeah. fine. Great. All right. Lovely. Um, then let's moving on now to our information reports, I believe. Um, these are copies of the financial reports, appropriation status report, et cetera, that will be approved for our next business meeting. Uh, moving on to consent agenda minutes. Uh, may I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. 
All right, these are the minutes from the April 18th board meeting, uh, as well as a special meeting that we had on April 25th. That was a special meeting which we addressed some Putnam, Northern, Westchester, BOCES budget and board candidate issues, as well as, um, I apologize for being late to that meeting. I was having some issues with Zoom. Thank you for your patience. Um, any discussion? No. no. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No? Great. All right, moving on to consent agenda financial. May I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. All right, uh, any discussion here? Anything to look out? No? All right, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No? All right. Moving on to consent agenda personnel. May I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. All right, anything we would like to, I believe there is something we'd like to discuss. I believe Ms. Alper is here, mm -hmm. right, Ms. Alper? That's you in the back. Yes, it is. Uh, Ms. Alper uh, is our chemistry candidate. Mm -hmm. I had the opportunity to meet with Ms. Alper. She's been through a few phases of the, the process along the way, uh, but we had the chance to meet last week, and I am so enthused uh, to welcome Ms. Alper to the Haldane community. And it's been some time since I've learned chemistry. <laughs> I'll say that. Although Ms. Alper would say you're involved in chemistry and learning chemistry all the time, uh, but it's a reflection of how engaged I was through the interview process. It's great when you can come out on the other end of the interview and say, I learned a few things along <laughs> the way that I didn't previously know, but it's more of a reflection of Ms. Alper's passion uh, for uh, chemistry. Uh, and the role that it plays in our students' lives. And uh, I'm very excited about the opportunity uh, to welcome you formally to Haldane uh, after the board acts on this uh, action item mm -hmm. in just a few seconds. But I, and, and, and Leah, if I can say, it, the next part of our business is fairly quick. If you wouldn't mind hanging around for a little bit so you can meet everybody, yeah. uh, that'd be great. And thanks for your patience this mm -hmm. evening for hanging in there. She's already put in two hours. Yeah, That's what I was going to say, you passed the test. On the clock. <laughs> we we, we really filled this right. one up for you to make right. sure. Okay, uh, great. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No? All right, I'm moving on to unfinished business. This is the resolution to approve the July 11th reorg meeting date. Ms. Shields? Be it resolved that upon the recommendation of the Superintendent of Schools, the Board of Education, in accordance with 17072 of the Education Law, hereby designates July 11th, 2023 as the 2023-2024 annual reorganization meeting. Great, may I have a motion please? So moved. Second. Any discussion? No, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No. All right, moving on to new business, Ms. Shields. Be it resolved that CSE, CPSE recommendations. Be it resolved that upon the recommendation of the Superintendent of Schools, the Board of Education hereby approves the recommendations of the Committees on Special Education and Preschool Special Education as presented. Great. May I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Any discussion? No? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No. All right. Moving on to the approval of the Westchester Putnam School Boards Association slate of officers and directors and budget for 2023 and 2024. Ms. Shields. Be it resolved that the Board of Education casts a yes vote for the 2023-2024 Westchester Putnam School Boards Association nominating committee slate of officers and directors and a yes vote to ratify the 2023-2024 Westchester Putnam School Boards Association budget. Great, may I have a motion please? So moved. Second. Any discussion? No, all right, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No. And this is our second communication from the public. This is on all district matters. I don't know if there's anybody else would like to come up and speak again or no. All right, then moving on to board reflections. I have one. Um, I just wanted to extend um, some sympathetic thoughts to the Sexton mm. family. Um, mm. Anthony Sexton really uh, recently passed away uh, and he, his children went through the Haldane School District in the 80s and 90s, and now his grandkids, his four grandkids, are in um, the elementary and middle school. Um, and I think his wife was served on the school board mm -hmm. for, for many years, back in the 80s and 90s it would be, but um, you know, he'll be missed. He was one of those on the blacktop picking up 
mm. shuffling mm. kids around. So extend our thoughts. Thank you, Maggie. Um, I, I wanted to, you know, extend my gratitude to all the folks that, uh, the parents that came out to decorate the stage for the high school uh, music concert that happened last year. Lots of very energetic folks, you know, lugging things in the rain and hanging them the last minute to put them up was, you know, was, was wonderful. So thanks to all the parents who did that. I really appreciate it. Anything else? No? All right, Dr. Bernante. Uh, oh, oh yes, Peggy. Thing. Really quick, I'll be quick. Um, so I, I remember after the winter concerts, um, I had heard such fantastic reviews of all the concerts. And so um, when spring came, I took the trouble to actually put them on my calendar. And I went to the high school mm -hmm. um, spring concert last Thursday. And it was just, it was really... Um, just really delightful. Yeah. Um, I was I was really so many different, um, so many different types of music, so many different musical groups, lots of enthusiasm. It was just really I was I was really glad that I had made um, the time to do it and was really really moved by um, some of the pieces. So it was a lot of it was a lot of fun. Yeah. I, I just learned this evening that I get to sign the diplomas of some of those students that I've known for such a very long time. So that's making, I'm a little giddy about that, to tell you the truth. Uh, Dr. Bernante. <laughs> uh, just would echo your thoughts around uh, the spring concert. And I believe all of the performances were recorded and are posted online. So if you didn't have a chance to attend, uh, I believe they're all on YouTube somewhere. Uh, I'll see if I can find that link and include it in the Friday report. Uh, just circling back uh, to the additional time the board requests, is it fair with respect to the class size discussion to come back to this on the 16th? Would that mm -hmm. be appropriate? And yeah. Get yeah, some was just direction there. I was going to ask whether that gives you enough time. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. I wouldn't uh, want to wait much longer than okay. that, though, just because uh, I feel a responsibility to inform families uh, yeah. Yeah. of where we're at with this and uh, go from there. So if it's, uh, we'll include it as a discussion item on the yeah. 16th, Great. and we'll go from there. All right. Thank you, Dr. Bernante. Thanks for everyone for showing up. Um, I would like to make, um, uh, shall we adjourn? Yes. All right. So we moved. shall. <laughs> May I have a second? A second. <laughs> Great. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you very oh, much. Hold, hold. One more board reflection. Can I sneak this in? We're off the record. Okay. Thank you to Mr. Asher for doing a, such a nice article in The Current on the tax cap. Oh, that's true. Yes. That was so informative. Yes. Nicely done. You try to learn that out.